this uh, session on anonymity, verifiability, and robustness. So the first talk is um, Better Pass, Adversarially Robust Bloom Filters, and this is joint work by Moni Noor and Noah Ved, and Noah is going to give the talk. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm Noah, and today I'm going to talk about our work, um, which is um, in this work we explore what does it mean to be a robust bloom filter, meaning bloom filter that uh, performs well even when facing adaptive adversary. And we, during this work, we suggested a few notions and highlight one in particular, the better path, as capturing the desired property of such a data structure. So what are bloom filters? Bloom filters are data structure that maintains some compressor presentation of a set and support approximate membership queries. And more precisely, we're giving a universe of elements and a subset of uh, S, uh, we do not, which denoted S, uh, of elements from this universe. Bloom filter composed of a setup and a query algorithm. The setup algorithm gets as input the set S and outputs a compressor presentation of this set. And um, the query algorithm gets this compressor presentation along with an element from the universe and output yes or no, equivalently one or zero, indicating whether this element belongs to the set or not. And the small memory used by Bloom filters, as opposed to storing S precisely, along with their fast query time, makes them extremely useful in various areas. But this comes at a price of a certain rate of false positive elements, meaning elements that do not belong to the set S, but declared as being in the set. And more formally, we say that the Bloom filter is n epsilon if for every set of size n, if we query an element from the set, the Bloom filter must output yes, while if we query an element that does not belong to the set S, it is allowed to answer yes, but with a small error probability, epsilon, and otherwise it answers no. And those false responses are called false positives. And as false positive impact the performance of applications using Bloom filters, it is important to ensure that they are appropriately distributed. And in our work, we ask what happens when we add an adversary to the game. What, um, what, how should we define the correctness guarantee? It is important to note that given a lower bound on the memory that uh, is found by Carter et al., if we wish to save space, this epsilon must be non-negligible. So it's not quite sure, uh, quite trivial how we should define the correctness guarantee. What does it mean for an adversary to succeed in finding false positives? Since epsilon is non-negligible, it is obvious that from time to time, she will succeed in finding false positives. But what does it mean for those events to happen infrequently? How can we claim that the data structure behave nicely? And here we enter. We aim to unify and provide a robustness definition of bloom filter facing adaptive adversarial behavior. And uh, recently, several papers have investigated this topic, suggesting different uh, robustness definitions. Two of such works are the one done by Norin Yogev and another one by Bender et al. Both of them were uh, considered ad adversary that use adaptivity in order to find false positive. While Bender et al, a main concern was the repeated queries. And in this work, we chose to follow the work of knowing your gift. We defined a new definition that are expressed as the test that the Bloom filter should withstand. And we formalize this by defining a game, which is called the adaptive game. In this game, we'll consider a polynomial time adversary that consists of two parts. First, it chooses the set S, which is then given to the setup algorithm of the Bloom filter. Then, knowing the set S, it performs adaptive queries, meaning it gets Oracle access to the query algorithm of the Bloom filters and perform queries. Um, one thing to note is that um, since the adversary knows the set S and Bloom filters admits only false positives and not false negative, we assume without lot of generality that those XI they do not belong to the set S, meaning they could be either false positive or true negative. And as a result, ideally, those YI are either zero and one with probability at most epsilon of being one. Um, okay, 
And in order to handle a computationally bound adversary, we had a security parameter, which is denoted by lambda and is given to both the adversary and the bloom filter as an input. In each test that we will show in next, the adversary aims to achieve a different goal in order to make the bloom filter fail the test. Um, our wishful thinking when trying to suggest the definition is that a robust bloom filter should be like a truly unpredictable bias coin. Meaning by looking at the response of the bloom filter on those adaptive cores, we want them to look like a, a sequence that is produced by a random bias coin with bias epsilon. Meaning we want to uh, visualize the false positives as random independent events. And one motivation for that is some applications uh, that use bloom filters are sensitive to clusters of false positive. And by clusters, I mean a false positive that appearing one after the other and the sequence uh, of, uh, of queries. And by requiring this uh, wishful thinking, those events happen with small probability. So with this in mind, our starting point was the work done by Noah when you give. They said that following those key adaptive queries, the adversary must output an element which she thinks is a false positive. And she wins the game if her output element, X star, is indeed a false positive. And we say that the bloom filter satisfies the NY definition if for every adversary, the probability that the output element is indeed a false positive is at most epsilon. Meaning that uh, we want those key adaptive queries to give her no valuable information in her attempt to find a false positive element. She might as well guess a random element from the universe. We showed in our work that um, this definition, this robustness definition, it does not imply our wishful thinking. And more concretely, we uh, show the a bloom filter that satisfies the NY robustness definition, but fail to satisfy our wishful thinking. It has a cluster to false positive. So we ask whether we can extend the NY definition. And we introduce a new notion, which is called better pass, BP for short. And in this test now, instead of outputting an element, we allow the adversary to pass meaning she does not have to provide any output. Following those key adaptive cores, she could either say, this is a false positive, or say, I don't know. And we define the adversary profit. She gains one of her epsilon if she indeed attempt, succeed in outputting a false positive uh, element. She, she gets penalized with one over one minus epsilon if her output element is a true negative, and her profit is zero if she chooses to pass. And we chose those payments such that a random guess with probability epsilon to be a false positive as expected profit of zero, which gives rise to our definition. We said that the bloom filter satisfies the better or pass, the BP a notion, if for every adversary our expected profit is at most zero. And recall the NY definition, we can think about it in the same way, only there the adversary must bet, he must output an element which he thinks is a false positive. And the edit the pass option suggests uh, that the adversary has more flexibility and maybe the BP is a stronger notion than the NY definition, which the, into, this intuition turns out to be true and we will see about that. But recall our wishful thinking that a robust bloom filter should behave like a truly unpredictable bias point. It has more a sequential nature. And so far we saw two tests that consider one time challenge. So it's not clear yet how those two notions relate to the wishful thinking. And in order to find the connection, we introduced a, a new test, which is the monotone test. And now we are not interested in any output. We only consider the, the response of the bloom filters on those the adaptive words, which we call the transcript. And just uh, to note, we allow the adversary to repeat query though repeated queries are not uh, counted. We're only interested in, uh, in our ability to find fresh false positive elements. So in this test, we had another component, which is a distinguisher, which is simply a, a function that gets the input a sequence of bits and output either zero or one. But we consider only monotone distinguishers, meaning that if we flip a bit in the input sequence from zero to one, the output can only increase. And uh, one example of such a distinguisher that you can have in mind is the cluster distinguishers, which may outputs one if and only if the input sequence contains some predefined number of consecutive one, for example, five. And the definition goes as follows. 
we say that a Bloom filter satisfies the monocon test notion and for every monocon uh, distinguisher and every adversary, the probability that B can distinguish between the transcript created by the Bloom filter and uh, the transcript created by a random bias point process is at most negligible. Note the similarity with the uh, cryptographic to the random notion. In both cases, we consider a distinguisher. Only now we are only interested in monotone distinguishers. And also we look at the difference between the probabilities. And here we do not have the absolute value or is there in the uh, cryptographic to the random notion, we have an absolute value. And the reason for this difference uh, is as follows. The transcript can contain sequence, can have a sequence that contains a lot of zeros. This could be, for example, because there are elements that are always true negatives and an adversary can choose to query those in specifically, or the false positive can be less than epsilon. Though this is hardly damaging, we're only interested in cases where an adversary increases the false positive rates or creates clusters of false positives. And this is exactly what the monotone property aims to model. So this test formalized our wishful thinking. And we showed that if we have a bloom filter that satisfies the BP notion, um, it also satisfies the monotone notion, leading to our desire that the BP test implies our wishful thinking. And today we see a proof sketch. And this proof reminds um, the proof in, in, crypto, in pseudorandomness that the next big test implies all efficient tests. So it's a proof by contradiction. And we have a Bloom filter that satisfies the BP notion, and we assume that it does not satisfy the monotone notion, meaning we have a distinguisher that can distinguish between the transcript created by an adversary uh, to the transcript created by a random bias point. And we use this distinguisher and adversary in order to build an adversary for the BP test. And this adversary in particular will know when it's best to bet on a false positive element. And we use the hybrid argument. And so given the hybrid argument, we have some index i such that the distinguisher is sensitive to a change in this index. So we, at first we take the adversary and uh, use it to, to query the i minus one queries. And then we ask it, what is your i query? But we do not query the Bloom filter with this element yet. We take this and put it as a prefix to two sequences that um, contains um, this as a prefix, as a suffix, they contain random bias bit, and in the i index, they contain one, uh, either zero or one, and we add it to the distinguisher. If the distinguisher is able to distinguish between those two sequences, we bet with the xi. Otherwise, if it fails to distinguish, then we say pass. In our work, we show that the probability that we, the, the adversary bet is not to be greater than zero, and the probability that given that we bet this xi is false positive is not to be greater than epsilon, leading to our desired contradiction that the expected profit of ABP is not to be greater than zero, which lead us to our desired contradiction. Okay, so to summarize, in our work, we highlight the notion of bet or pass as capturing the um, strongest guarantee we can currently imagine, our wishful thinking. In addition, it is formalized as a simple test. It is pretty, co pretty convenient to take a, a construction of a Bloom folder and see if it satisfies this test. What we haven't seen today, but we showed in our work that it's not too strict notion, meaning there exists the construction of a Bloom filter satisfies this notion, and it's based on one-way function. And some intuition for this construction is we take a reasonable construction of a Bloom filter and add cryptography upon it. And in our journey to find the best definition of a robust Bloom filter, we suggest more notions, which turns out to be weaker and found a relationship between those notions. Um, it is not clear yet whether the other direction is true, whether monotone test implies BP test or whether those two notions are separable. In addition, it may be interesting to see what happens when we allow the adversary to repeat queries, what happens to the definitions and the relationship between those. Um, that's it, thank you. Do we have any questions for now? Oh, thank you so much. Um, 
So Bloom filters are often like runtime updatable in various ways, like whether it's only add to the set or maybe update the set in some other way. Yeah. Um, does your work, and obviously maybe it's in the paper, but does your work explore how like adversarially updatable sets or even maybe honestly updatable sets affect um, some of these interactions? Yeah, so regarding adversarial updatable sets, we haven't looked at it, but honestly, we, we think with high confidence that it doesn't affect the notions and the relationship between those. Yeah. There's one more question here. Uh, <laughs> uh, we can repeat it otherwise, just go ahead. I'm just curious. So the definitions are really nice, uh, like monotone tests and so on. Um, I'm just wondering why, it, like for example, monotone definition. It seems like you really split the attackers into two basically non-communicating guys. But basically, my, my question is: Do you have some toy, maybe full applications of these Bloom filters, where your definition will be enough? Because right now, it's, I mean, it's very nice. I get the intuition, but I'm just worried about composability that you have this nice definition but then you plug it in into some simple constructions things actually it will not be enough so do you have some maybe toy application where this is fully enough the, your definition the bp definition uh well any of you for example bp definition yeah. it would be fully enough for the final application um yeah you can think of for example a server that contains k components and uh, each component using a bloom filter and there's an adversary that knows um, for that if uh, it gets some element, it's for sure a false positive element. So all the other definition in the BP um, th that doesn't uh, allow the adversary the flexibility of querying only when the advers when uh, they know that it's a false positive. For example, so if those K components are proxies or something like that, um, if we an attacker that is allowed to query only when it's no, it's a false positive, can query those uh, components at one time and create, for example, a DOS uh, attack, while the other definition fails to uh, protect against this kind of attack. I hope it was clear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next talk and let's talk now again. Right, so while well, the speaker sets up, so the next work is on anonymous whistleblowing over authenticated channels. This is work by Thomas Agricola, Jofra Couteau, and Sven Mayer, and Sven will be giving the talk. Test, test, test. Okay. Good, so uh, as was already mentioned, my talk is on anonymous whistleblowing over authenticated channels. This is joint work with Thomas Agricola from KAT in Germany and Geoffroy Couteau from CNRS in Paris. So whistleblowing basically defines com uh, publishing confidential information and since usually of wrongdoing from, from, from agencies, sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, so, and governments don't usually like that when people do that. So there's a strong incentive in 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 defining in making it, it providing means to make it anonymous. So to give them the chance to publish information without revealing the own identity. There's a lot of different methods to do that. Some of them are listed here, and essentially they all are based on two implicit assumptions. One is that there's a lot of people present that could be the sender. So you hide in a group of, of people that might have sent this information. Um, the second one is that you incorporate many parties, which makes it sufficiently uh, prob probable that at some point you get a uh, trusted or non-colluding party, which provides anonymity. Now, the first one is somewhat obvious that you need this because if no one's there to hide you, then you're, it's clear who you are. 
the second thing we we ask the question whether this is inherent or if it's possible to have a whistleblowing method that works without any trusted parties in the process so we modeled this as anonymous transfer which is basically a simplification of that um, the basic idea is that there's three parties so um, basically a participant a non-participant and a receiver the participant wants to send a bit to a receiver and the non-participant doesn't do anything it doesn't even know that the process is that they that anything is happening at all uh, so we say that an anonymous transfer is correct with uh, is epsilon correct if the bit is transferred with probability epsilon so what the receiver reconstructs after the process is the same that the participant entered with probability epsilon plus we want some anonymity meaning that from the viewpoint of the receiver there are just two parties which do random things which aren't really distinguishable from just acting normally so we say it's that's anonymous if the probability that the receiver can determine which of the two parties was the sender is at most one minus delta half so preferably we would want both of them to be relatively close to one because then the message is transferred correctly but the the sender remains anonymous and the best that the receiver can do is guess however unfortunately um this is not possible to have both of them overwhelming in the security parameter so either the correctness or the anonymity must be suboptimal uh, why is that so in the easiest case the anonymous transfer is basically non-interactive this means that there's just two parties who insert a single message and then there's some reconstruction function that lets the receiver put in both of the messages and reconstruct the bit that was to be sent now in the communications model uh, we, we use synchronous communication so the message that the actual sender needs to send is independent of the message that the other non-participant has sent so it's not possible to somehow make them dependent on each other which means that in order to get the desired level of correctness the actual sender needs to construct a message that reconstructs the bits that is to be transferred regardless of what the other party inputs so why is that not so good because if the receiver is adversarial it can use the same message that party zero sends and use own randomness for its for the party one message in that case um so at a high level either p0 is the sender then this message actually encodes the bit that is to be sent and then it will due to the correctness property also send the same message with a different party one message however if party one is the sender then none of those two messages actually depend on the bits so as a, an easy attack on the on the anonymity based on the correctness is possible here so but what is this what if we look at interactive protocols namely c round protocols um if we have a protocol that has c rounds then h round can depend on the previous rounds which is obvious but um if we look at the serum protocol from how it's constructed it's basically you can consider it as z minus one program protocol with an additional round at the end where the parties basically construct their last message based on the transcript that was previous previously created now why why does that why is that good because we can just consider a different protocol which does the same thing for the first c minus one rounds but in the final round it just replaces both messages by random bits of sufficient length and now we can analyze this protocol so it now holds that either the final round really has a high impact on the on the correctness of the protocol meaning that after c minus one rounds it's still not clear what the bit should which bit should be transferred and in the final round the bit then gets fixed to the desired correctness now if this protocol doesn't send the same bit then the same attack from before is possible namely where we just replace the message of one party which we hope to be the sender by randomness and then compare the result with what was in the honest protocol 
However, if the final round doesn't have a high impact on the correctness, then we have a C minus one round protocol, which is comparatively uh, which is comparatively correct. So the it's maybe not that correct, but not sufficiently for the attack. But in that case, the same argumentation, the same reasoning works for the C minus one round protocol. So we have now a C minus one round protocol, which has a comparative correctness and just removing one round doesn't have any effects on the anonymity. So in total, we can do the same reasoning on the C minus one round protocol and eventually either end up at the non-interactive protocol because we always just remove the final round where we have already shown that it's not possible or we find a round that can be attacked by the same type of attack because it's where the bit is defined really. So since it's not possible to construct it perfectly secure, meaning also not with overwhelming anonymity and, um, and correctness, uh, we took some compromises to still get some sort of a meaningful uh, instantiation. So what we did was we fixed the anonymity by just saying maybe it's enough to have delta 0 0.99. And instead of going to the asymptotically and asymptotic setting where we say that the honest protocol execution time can be described by a polynomial in the security parameter and the adversary needs some super polynomial time, we go to a fine grain setting where we have much closer bounds where we basically say the protocol itself takes time t and the adversary is has to take at least t squared steps to perform the attack. Plus we use some ideal obfuscation, which is basically obfuscation in terms of an oracle. So you can, so uh, this does not contradict the proof. The proof is even valid when you when we assume ideal obfuscation. Now for time reasons, I cannot go into the protocol, but uh, why does the protocol still make sense? So um, there's the famous paper by Impact Lietzo about the five worlds of cryptography. I believe they are known because they were just explained on Monday. Uh, there's two worlds which I want to emphasize here. Uh, one is obfuscopia, which is basically the world which contains all the problems that can be solved if we assume obfuscation. Another one is impossibilitopia, which is basically the world that contains all the problem that even if we have obfuscation, we cannot solve. Now, an interesting question is how these worlds relate in different settings. So there's a lot of previous works on, on separating them from quantum, from, no, from classical, and of course from classical and fine-grained. So uh, in the fine-grained setting, it is known that those two worlds basically collapse. So uh, there's, a con there's a paper from 2008 that showed that in the fine-grained setting, exponentially secure one-way functions suffice to create a public key encryption and the fine-grained public key encryption. So the question is, are there any further separating results? Now we haven't shown that for the, for the highest classes, but we've taken a step towards showing this because we've shown that um, anonymous transfer with overwhelming correctness and anonymity is in classical asymptotic uh, impossibilitopia. So it cannot be constructed even if we assume obfuscation. But in the fine-grained setting, uh, we believe that there's also a construction uh, in obfuscopia with fine-grained security based on with which has overwhelming anonymity. Now, our anonymity is not overwhelming, so it's still an open question whether this construction really exists, but we consider it a first step in that direction. So in conclusion, um, we, we modeled anonymous whistleblowing as anonymous transfer and showed that it's not efficiently possible, it's not possible at all to get it with overwhelming correctness and anonymity. But there's a fine grained construction, which is non-trivial, which might be a candidate to separate the, the worlds between asymptotic and, and fine grained cryptography. So are there any questions? No. Any questions for Sven?
Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so you said that your use of ideal obfuscation doesn't uh, jeopardize the impossibility result. Yes. Uh, do you mean that it could be done with a physical assumption or something like, I mean, that you make black box use of it? Sorry? Oh, okay. What, what do you mean by uh, the fact that you rely on ideal obfuscation doesn't uh, trivialize the impossibility result? Um, the impossibility result also holds if we assume that the part that the protocol makes use of, of ideal obfuscation. So um, we just say there is no protocol even with Oracle access to some other protocol to some sub functionality. Any more questions? Yeah. So, so maybe I just wanted to ask a, a very basic question. Yeah. So when you talk about protocols for your impossibility result, what is the exact communication? Well, so who's talking with whom who can talk? So it's P0, P1 and the receiver only or what? No, no, so everything happens through a broadcast channel, but an authenticated broadcast channel. This is the one assumption that we make this channel, which where everybody can send a message and then everybody knows who sends it. Okay. And basically the communication itself is happening through steganographic means by mm -hmm. to hide the fact that communication is happening at all. Right. So it's but it okay, good, thanks. All right. All right. So if there are no more questions, so let's thank Sven again. And the next speaker can set up. All right, so the next talk is on uh, poly onions, achieving anonymity in the presence of churn, and uh, Miranda will be giving the talk. Thank you. So I'll be speaking about poly onions, achieving anonymity in the presence of churn. This is joint work with Megumi Ando, Annalise Kinskaya, and Tal Malkin. So in our problem, we have Alice and Bob as usual, and Alice wants to anonymously send a message to Bob. Now, she can't directly send her message M, even if she encrypts it, because an adversary who sees the network traffic can see a packet going from Alice's server to Bob's server and know that they're communicating. More precisely, what we mean by anonymous is we don't want an adversary to be able to tell who Alice is talking to, even if it can observe all of the network traffic and corrupt a constant fraction of the nodes or servers. So you can think of anonymity as a game-based definition where the adversary specifies two users, Bob and Charlie, who Alice might be talking to. The challenger chooses one of these uniformly at random. And then the adversary can view a run of the communication protocol with Alice talking to this chosen party. And then the adversary tries to guess whether Bob or Charlie was chosen. And the adversary shouldn't guess right with negligibly more probability than one half. So one prominent solution to this problem is onion routing. You might have heard of this in the context of Tor, which is a commonly used variant of this in practice. Um, and this involves Alice encrypting her message in layers, hence the name onion, and sending it through an intermediary server, Ivan, on the way to Bob. Now, when Ivan gets this onion, he peels it or decrypts it with his secret key to reveal the next layer of the onion forwards it along to Bob, who can then decrypt or peel it again to reveal the message. And the reason why we have this layered encryption thing is we want onions to mix at honest intermediary servers. And what we mean by mixing is that the adversary shouldn't be able to correlate the incoming traffic with the outgoing traffic. So here, since the outer layer of the onion before it gets to Ivan looks uncorrelated from the next layer of the onion when it leaves Ivan, the adversary can't really tell who Alice is talking to. But crucially, Ivan here needs to be honest because if the adversary knows his secret key, the adversary can peel the onion and it knows what the incoming and outgoing traffic for that onion looks like. And in fact, it's not enough for Alice to just route her onion through Ivan because we need Ivan to be honest with high probability. 
So instead, we can have many intermediary servers, and then as we increase this number, the probability that more of them are honest increases. And prior work has shown that there exists an onion routing protocol that's anonymous with a polylogarithmic number of rounds. And in fact, this is tight. A polylogarithmic number of rounds is necessary. So this is nice and all, but we're not done yet, in particular because this prior work is in what's called the single run setting without churn. So the single run setting means that the adversary observes one run of the protocol. So Alice sends one message to Bob and that's it. In the real world, this is a bit unrealistic um, because Alice might be sending more messages over a longer time scale. And we want her to remain anonymous, even if she sends many messages to the same person over and over again. So this multi-run setting is challenging. Also prior work assumed that all servers are online throughout the duration of the protocol. This is a bit unrealistic as well, especially when you have multiple runs of the protocol. Since people's internet connections are bad, it's likely, likely that servers will go offline unpredictably in the real world. Um, and we want to be able to model this. So we call this network churn, where servers might go offline unpredictably. Now, revisiting our standard onion routing example, let's see what happens if Ivan is offline. Since Ivan's secret key is necessary to decrypt this onion and reveal the next layer, if Ivan is offline, then Bob will never be able to recover Alice's message because nobody can decrypt this onion. So we want a solution to this problem. Um, but before coming up with a solution, we need to define what problem we're actually trying to solve. So we needed a new notion of anonymity in this multi-run setting with network churn. This definition didn't exist before. Once we had this definition, we were able to show that for a natural class of onion routing protocols, this includes many existing protocols, single run anonymity implies multi run anonymity. So now we can just prove that a protocol is anonymous in the single run setting. Uh, and this is nice because the work is done for us and implies multi run anonymity. But this doesn't deal with network churn yet. So the next thing we did is we defined a new kind of onion encryption called poly onion encryption that's more robust um, to this case when Ivan is offline. So it lets us sort of recover in that case, as I'll explain later. And part of defining this was including security definitions that capture this notion of mixing that I mentioned earlier. We then construct a poly onion encryption scheme and show that it satisfies our definition of security. And finally, we're able to use this poly onion encryption scheme um, we apply it to a known onion routing protocol to obtain a protocol that is anonymous against a passive adversary in the multi-run setting with churn. Now, revisiting our problem where Ivan is offline. In this case, when the onion can't continue past Ivan, we say that the onion is dropped. And now remembering that we needed a polylogarithmic number of rounds for anonymity, if we have a constant fraction of the servers offline, then Alice's onion will be dropped with overwhelming probability. So we can't have some solution where Alice just sends her message multiple times and increases the probability that it'll arrive at Bob uh, because the probability of it being dropped is so high. So we need something a little bit more clever. And a first attempt at solving this problem was called Duo Onions, proposed in 2005 by Iwanek, Klonowski, and Kudelowski. The idea here is that Alice's onion is peelable not just by this one intermediary, Ivan, but also by another candidate intermediary, Ida. And so here, if Ivan is offline, the onion can instead be set to Ida, who's also able to peel the onion with her secret key. And so this keeps the onion going through the network. But a problem here is it's harder to achieve mixing. In fact, if either Ivan, or that should say Ida, is corrupted, then the adversary is able to trace the onion and no mixing occurs. And I'll show you how the adversary does this. This notably is a passive attack, so the adversary doesn't need to deviate from the protocol at all. And what happens here is since the adversary knows Ivan's secret key, it sees this onion going to Ida, and the adversary just in its head can decrypt the onion using its secret key to learn what the next layer looks like. Then the adversary can look at the network traffic leaving Ida, and match this next layer of the onion to the traffic, and it knows exactly where the onion is going in the next hop. So this results in what we say is a higher effective corruption rate. The probability that mixing occurs 
at any hop is now much lower because it's sufficient for the adversary to corrupt either Ivan or Ida. Another issue with this construction is that there are only two candidate intermediaries. So the probability that the onion is dropped is still quite high. We're only getting a constant improvement. Whereas really we would want to expand to a larger number of candidate intermediaries. And then as long as one of them is online, the onion isn't dropped. But now we have this trade-off between the number of candidates and the higher effective corruption rate. So it's sort of not clear how to set the number of candidates in a way that lets us both allow the onion to remain in the network and achieve mixing. Our solution, poly onions, introduces a committee. Um, and it also introduces the notion of a primary candidate who is supposed to be able to peel the onion if they're online versus an alternate candidate who can peel the onion only if the primary is offline. And this alternate candidate needs to receive a key from a committee in order to peel the onion. So the alternate can't peel the onion just with its secret key. So Ivan here can no longer perform this attack. Instead, Ivan needs to ask the committee for a key that's necessary to peel the onion. And what the committee will do is it'll ask Ida if she's online. If she's honest and online, she'll respond that she is online. The committee will see this and will tell Ivan, no, Ida is online. I'm not giving you the key. And Ivan will not be able to peel this onion. Introducing this committee, assuming that the majority of the committee members are honest, gives us mixing as long as the primary candidate is honest and online. And crucially here, the probability that this happens is independent of the number of candidates. And so we're able to extend our construction to accommodate any number of candidates, which lets us boost the probability that the onion is not dropped arbitrarily by tuning this perimeter. Now I'll give a very high level overview of how we actually achieve this in our encryption scheme. So shown here is the structure of a ciphertext in standard onion encryption. Um, there are these K blocks which contain symmetric keys that are necessary to peel the onion for each hop. And this U block contains Alice's actual message. And so importantly, there's a symmetric key, K sub I, that's needed to peel the rest of the onion. Now, the way that it's constructed, only Ida, the first candidate, is able to decrypt with her secret key, uh, the first K block, and obtain the symmetric key that lets her peel the rest of the onion. So we want to have this committee protocol that lets Ivan, the secondary alternate candidate, um, also obtain the symmetric key if the committee lets him. And we do this by adding an H block, which contains inputs for the committee to run this protocol for each hop. And so in this first H block, there uh, it contains the identities of the committee members and also the inputs for them to run the protocol. And these inputs for the committee are basically secret shares of the symmetric key. And so if enough of the committee members agree that the first candidate is offline, they can return these secret shares. And then the symmetric key can be reconstructed in order to peel the onion. Um, and this whole ciphertext is constructed by Alice when she's forming her onion. So she is the one who chooses the committee members for each hop and sets up the inputs for them to be able to run the protocol. So this is the overall structure of our onion. We have the K block containing the keys necessary to peel the rest of the onion, the H block, which lets us have the committee protocol that contains the inputs for them. And finally, this U block, which contains the actual message. Now today I focused on how we construct our poly onion encryption scheme. Uh, if you're interested in any of the other aspects of our paper, you can find them in the full paper on ePrint or ask me. And finally, Here's a reward for listening. This is Luna, my co-author Megumi's daughter, who was born while we were writing this paper. And it turns out that you can buy onion teether toys online. So she's gotten a very early start in onion routing. You can look out for her next paper soon. Thank you. Any questions? Well, so maybe I'll start with one. Just uh, oh, there's one. Okay, good. Oh, no, go, 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 go. No, no, no. Sorry, just I just you were just hidden um, behind. The... So I I assume the committee has like two thirds honest majority going on among it. 
We just need an honest majority. Okay. Um, but the parameters are tunable. Uh, like Alice can choose how many committee members she wants to be honest when she forms her onion. Gotcha. And then, so does the the like constant corruption threshold. So like it's corrupted at the beginning, and then at some like you're choosing your committees with these corruptions having already occurred, and then there's no adaptivity there, right? Yeah. So within each run of the protocol, um, we assume static corruption, but the adversary can corrupt based on previous runs of the protocol in the multi-run setting. So, so I guess the question is also uh, about relaxing the model. So you need synchronicity in a number of different ways, right? For, for rounds and I guess also for detecting whether someone is offline. So is there anything that can be relaxed a little bit uh, to you know, have some almost synchronicity or asynchronous, but we crash detection or is there something that can be done or is just clearly impossible? That's a good question. Mm. I don't know, mm. but... I'll think about it for future work. Thank you. Oh, you again. So you obviously abstracted a clean uh, theoretical primitive, but I can see like issues, for example, to put this on timing information, maybe the person is online now, but late offline, and adjust a bit late for later, and then peel all the onion later. Is your scheme, I mean, you omitted some details. Do you have basically a full solution taking all this kind of external things into the account that is, would be run, or this is just the first abstraction and much more work needs to be done to make it a full system? So I can't say that we took all things into account, but the thing that you mentioned about people like going offline and coming back later, um, we assume that adversarially controlled parties can pretend to be offline and then later pretend to be online again. So we do capture that. And we also model the churn as being adversarially controlled. All right, then I think there are no more questions. We can move to the next speaker and take Miranda again. All right, so the the last talk of the session is on the price of verifiability, lower bounds for verifiable random functions. That's work by Nicholas Brand, Dennis Hofeins, Julia Kastner, and um, Akinu Nal. And Nicholas is going to give the talk. Right. Okay, yeah. So thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, so this talk is essentially about um, trying to explain uh, why it's hard to get random so, uh, to get verifiable random functions with short proofs. Um, so first of all, what's a random uh, verifiable random function? It's essentially a public key analog of a pseudo random function, which we all know, um, and it has a, a generation algorithm which essentially gives you the secret key, the evaluation key, and also a verification key. And the, the evaluation function is just uh, adapted to produce the image, um, but also to produce a proof for this image. So um, since it's a public key primitive, we also have a verification procedure. So the verification procedure obviously takes the public key, takes the pre-image, takes the image, takes the proof, and then verifies if this uh, image is indeed the correct image for this pre-image. Okay, and uh, the guarantee is uh, obviously it's like a pseudo random function. So um, the like an image for for a pre image should look like randomness. Uh, but here we also have um, we have to consider the fact that this is a public key primitive. So the an image should look pseudo random even if you're given a verification key and even if the adversary can query um, like evaluation has access to an evaluation oracle, right? 
Um, and then at the end, it submits a challenge and then only gets the image, not the proof. I mean, if it would get the proof as well, then it would kind of tr be trivial to distinguish it from randomness, right? Um, but moreover, we have this really strong property called unique probability, which essentially states that even for maliciously generated verification keys, there's no way to prove two different images to be the correct image for some pre-image. So formally, it's like, uh, for any possible verification key and all pre-images, and if you have two, uh, if you have two images and any proofs, if both of these images verify with any proof, then they're the same image. Right. And here's some applications which are really relevant for the TCC community. Uh, and. Uh, um, uh, and uh, so we can just go through to, to motivate our, our work, we can just go through uh, some historic constructions of it. We, I think we have some pioneer, VRF pioneers here. Um, so one of the first constructions, which was not RSA based, was the Lysianskaya VRF, which is essentially kind of an adaptation of the uh, non Rygold PRF, where you have um, a group element uh, exponenti uh, exponentiated to some product. And um, this uses uh, a pairing scheme to essentially consecutively verify all of these factors. You start with uh, a group element to the first factor, and then you pair it with the second factor, and then pair it with the next factor, and so on, until you reach the image. And um, this is a decent uh, verification key size, and proof size is linear. But the downside is, I mean, this is uh, 20 years old, so uh, the downside is we can't expect too much from it. The downside is that it uses a specific assumption, which is a Q-type assumption. And this means that the assumption size grows with the security parameter, uh, which is not really desirable. And then the next uh, construction is the dodis polsky construction, which is really succinct. It's a really elegant, simple construction. But again, um, they, it relies on a Q-type assumption. And also, it only supports relatively small inputs. Uh, and then, some years later, we have the whole fine Siagel construction, which um, kind of has worse parameters, but therefore it only relies on a on a standard assumption, the decisional linear assumption. And then we have some uh, some other work from uh, Lisa Cole, which has worse parameters uh, in the verification key, but only also a standard assumption. And the proof size is almost constant. You can tune this construction to get any super constant proof size. So um, I don't know if this is really visible here, but here I highlighted kind of the downsides of all of these four constructions. It's like either we have um, a Q type assumption or we have largish proofs where this is obviously like really small, but still super constant. And these constructions are not, not really practical. So the question is, can we get VRFs with constant size proofs? I mean, constant size in the number of group elements. Um, and in general, this is really hard. So here I also want to mention that there's also the Bitansky VRF, which is kind of, you can construct generically from Nevis. Um, but so in general, we, we don't know. But we can observe like lots of constructions and see that they have a certain structure to them. So. Most of them use this consecutive verification strategy, which I will get into in, in a second. And uh, also we can observe that most of these uh, VRFs, they have th their images have a specific form. So um, they have some, some generator to the power, which can be expressed as some uh, numerator, depending on the verification key exponents. Uh, divided by some denominator, which is with also with respect to the verification key exponents. And so our contributions, uh, are the, the first one is essentially that um, the verification, if, if you use this consecutive verification approach, then this image will always have this rational form. The, the image will always have this rational form of the numerator divided by the, the denominator. And furthermore, the degree of these polynomials is as, as most exponential in the proof size. And the second uh, result is then, if you have a logarithmic proof size, then obviously the degree will be polynomial. And then we can show by a meta reduction that the univariate polynomial size assumptions are insufficient to get uh, such a VRF. 
Um, I unfortunately don't have time to go into the meta reduction too much, but uh, you can just ask me or Aki in, uh, or just read the paper. Um, yeah, and then the second one is also a meta construction, which is has slightly different, uh, a slightly different setting, which is if the proof size is constant, then the degree is also constant, and then we can kind of rule out a uh, smaller size assumption. So this univariate assumption means essentially that um, the the assumption only has like one variable, um, which is uh, which I, I'll show I'll, I'll show an example of this univariate. And smaller size means it can be multivariate, but it has just as a uh, few elements. Okay, so what do you mean by consecutive verifiability? So here I denoted uh, the verification the three ver verification key elements, two proof elements, and here in the second row is just the exponents. So by definition, we will just assume that the verification key elements are already verified. And to verify the next element, we have some pairing equation, which is a quadratic equation. And if this equation holds, then uh, we say that the, the element pi one is also verified. And this uh, pairing equation, this, this quadratic equation on the exponents, we can express this using a, uh, a pairing in which we actually enter the group elements. And we do this just consecutively. So to verify the next proof element, we again have this, uh, this uh, equation. And note that to verify some proof element, we only input the verification key elements and the proof elements up until that point. Okay, that's where the consecutive comes in. And then finally, we, uh, we verify the image. And the one technical restriction is here that in the ith uh, verification equation, the, the element pi, the exponent pi can only occur linearly. So that's the reason why we get this rational form. If this were to occur quadratically, then, then we would get some kind of square roots, which we can't deal with at the moment. Okay, so I'll use this notation here. We are in a pairing setting. So we have a source group with a generator uh, small g and a target group with a small generator uh, small, small g t. And we have this pairing operation and then the verification key is just denoted uh, as group elements with the exponents vi. Okay, so let's take the dodis jampolsky uh, VRF as an example. This is really simple. You just the verification key is just one group element, and uh, so the generator plus one other group element, and the image has this form. So here you can also already kind of see the rational form. Um, it's just one over the secret key. So essentially, v two is the secret key plus the the image, and the proof. And this is uh, the um, in the in the target group. So the proof element is essentially the same element, but in the source group. And now you can already think, okay, if I have a pairing, what can I do with these two elements? Well, I can verify like this. So the verification works like this. You just take the generator from your verification key, exponentiate it with X, multiply the second verification key element on, onto it, and then uh, pair it with the, with the proof. So this, this is essentially here the equation for the exponents. And then you just do the second part here um, and you just verify that the proof element is essentially the same element as the image just in a source group. And the assumption here is the Q diffie hellman inversion assumption. So you get this tuple of uh, group elements and you're, you're supposed to compute this element here. And here you can always already see that this is a univariate assumption. So there's only one secret variable, which is the alpha. And uh, yeah, so uh this this particular construction here has this property of consecutive verifiability you can see here in the first part of the verification you only use verification key elements and the proof element and then in the second part to verify the image you only use verification key element image uh, uh, verification key elements and already verified proof elements so uh, yeah th these are the pairing equations the consecutive pairing equations and these images, they have a rational form with a small degree in this case. I mean, the uh, numerator is just constant and the denominator is, is just linear here. Okay, so uh, to summarize, uh, in the paper, we show that if you have this specific form of consecutive verifiability, 
then your VRF will have a rational form. The images will have this rational form. And if you have short proofs, then the degree of this rational form image will also be small. I mean, it's exponential, but still small. Um, and if you have a small degree, then the univariate assumptions are too weak to, uh, to, to give you uh, a VRF by a meta reduction. So meta reduction is essentially, you assume you have a reduction and then you simulate an adversary for this reduction and the meta reduction kind of replays the, the reduction to solve its own challenge. Um, yeah, and the, the, the third result is essentially if you have constant degree, then we can rule out kind of uh, any Uber type uh, short assumption, meaning few elements. And uh, some technicalities, this is, uh, uh, we assume here that this goes by algebraic reductions and this is, these are by generic reductions. Okay, so the takeaway is here essentially that the core construction is essentially optimal if you want some small assumption, if you want some standard assumption. You cannot get the constant size proofs, but any super constant size proofs. Uh, to improve over this, to, to, to step outside of this paradigm, you need some form of different verification. You need to come up with some weird notion of verification. And um, some corollaries or some technical side notes of this is that decisional assumptions are inherently stronger. So we have some kind of separation between decisional assumptions and computational assumptions. And the last thing is that um, this is also, I think, theoretically interesting that there cannot be an analog, an algebraic analog of the Goldreich Levin predicate. Okay, that's, that's it. Do we have any questions? One VRF pioneer has a question. <laughs> I, I expected this. <laughs> yeah, we all did. <laughs> uh, so, so, to what extent um, your results would generalize to me? Uh, to me, be using more such like, like for example, in practice, I can always take if I want to increase the domain of the array, I can always apply collision resistant function for to the input to shrink it a little bit. But syntactically, it looks like if you want to reduce to like I don't know collision resistant plus some assumption, your result might not apply. I hope they do, but. Uh, and you know, even more ambitiously, there is like a random oracle probably to overcome it. But uh, so we did not look at random oracle um, constructions, but our results are essentially kind of independent of the input space. So it's more the, the question is, um, what's the proof size? So we relate the proof size to the degree of this function. So if you accept that you have this type of consecutive verifiability then your VRF will have this structure, right? And if the proof is too small, then then we get our meta reductions and they are more or less independent of the input space. But, but philosophically, I guess you're saying if the construction is really kind of pairing group based and uh, um, kind of everything happens in the pairing group, um, but it's not clear if you want to use some other primitive, I don't know, encryption or Mac or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe it will help. Yes. It seems like it shouldn't, but it's outside of you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So this, that's why I also mentioned the Vitansky yeah. VRF because yeah. this is completely outside. I mean, uh, if you don't, if you have something which is not necessarily entirely group based, then it's not even clear how you define the size of the proof, right? right. It, it, because we just say, okay, the size of the proof is the number of group yeah. elements. Makes and, sense. Yeah. Yeah. The number of bits of the proof. We don't know anything about that. Like this is really restricted to group the pairing setting. Um, yeah, I mean, it, there's some trivia effect, right? If the proof is only has only constant size, then you could just try a, try out every proof. Uh, yeah, don't know. Very quick, what about generic group? I mean, some who maybe it's like, what if you say I have a generic group? I don't know, Mauro Shoop, I don't know which one yet. Yeah, so so this is actually what we so this second uh, construction here actually assumes that the kind of the group is generic, uh, or at least the uh, the reduction is generic. Um, in the in the second, uh, so the, this result here, this only assumes that your reduction gives you some kind of linear combination of the output relative to the input. Uh, but the second result is essentially independent of what the group representation is. Nice. All right. If there are no more questions, then let's thank all of the speakers of the session and head out for lunch. <laughs>